Venga. All right, welcome, folks. We made it. We got it. Krista West over there, Avalia Mediterranean Folk Embroidery on the left, and Jennifer Frozen Stiff on the right. We hope that straightens itself out. Oh, we lost Jennifer all the way around. She'll be back. We lost her. It's terrible. So Krista's with us tonight. Really excited. Uh, here comes Jennifer. Hang on. Oops. Uh, there we go. We switched it around. Now Chris is in the middle. Jennifer's on the right. Okay. Sorry, okay. I forgot to turn off that alarm and oh. it kicked me out. It's my fault. Okay, no problem. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. I'm gonna have to do that too. Okay, we'll deal with it. Go ahead. <laughs> we'll deal. Go ahead. Okay. All we'll right. All so know that it's time for Georgia to go to swim. Okay. Okay. All right, so Chris is here. We've got 23 or so photos of ecclesiastical designs of all kinds, and we're just going to get to learn about history, background, uh, the whole bit. It's going to be, uh, I've really been wanting to do this for quite a while, and it came up spontaneously here a couple weeks ago, and so now we're able to do it, and really appreciate it, Krista. I know this is, this is automatic stuff for you, but uh, for us, it's going to be fun to learn, so... Um, oh, it's not always automatic for me too. Like I'm, I'm always seeing new things and kind of using this knowledge to sort of process information and patterns and things like that. So no, it's definitely not automatic for me. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, I have a lot of experience, but yeah. Yeah. All right. And Avlia.life is where you go to get her embroidery and cross stitch kits. And Jennifer, hold up that one you're working on. Cause that's pretty oh. cool. Oh. Right there. <laughs> yeah. Do you still have that pillow there, uh, Krista? Oh yeah, this is the finished pillow. Yeah. So here's. That's what oh, that's what's gonna be right there. Yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. It is. I know. Yeah, it's really a good one. It's a yeah. nice one. So there you go. There. That's the tease. That's the tease. There, folks. Avlia dot <laughs> life. Okay. So that's tonight. All right. Now uh, make some notes here, folks, because coming up we have quite a lineup coming up for the Wednesday shows. Uh, next week we go to Sydney, Australia. And April uh, is going to take us through, she, there's an artist, a quilt artist. This is for quilters, so tell your quilting friends to come see this. Uh, the exhibit this month is Toward Abstraction, an exhibition of modern quilts. And there's a lot of abstract work and some, just some beautiful stuff. So uh, um, April will be with us Wednesday, next Wednesday to take us through that. And then she has one of the quilters who did a lot of the work who is also going to be with us. So we'll get to ask questions. So a lot of us who don't quilt will just learn. And if you have quilter friends or quilt, you're going to be in your glory. Uh, so that's next week. Then the week after, Deb DeCrane, make a note. I hope Deb's here. The week after, we're going to go back to Sydney, Australia, because it'll be the first week of a new exhibit with Margaret Lee, Japanese and Chinese embroidery. And Margaret Lee is the master of masters. And I did an interview with her like a year and a half ago, and, and go listen to that. We talk fiber.com, just put in Margaret Lee and listen to that. But she will be with us in two weeks with April to talk about her exhibit with Chinese and Japanese embroidery. And uh, so, you know, make a note for that. Then we'll have a week on the 9th where uh, Beth, Jennifer, and I will just stitch and chat. And then we'll come back the 16th, Carrie Noss. I, Pray to God I've got this name right. I need to learn. N-O-E-S-S. -S, I think it's Noss. Carrie Noss <laughs> is going to give us a demonstration on needle lace. So, oh, really? right. So we have two tours, two tours, a stitch and chat night, and then needle lace with Carrie. So, in, in yeah, really, uh, I'm excited about this lineup <laughs> here all the way through June 16. Um, we're gonna we're got some pretty neat things so make notes of that and set aside time on the Wednesday nights to join us and then as you saw on the opening panel we still have all of the uh, uh, charts going on the Botany Bay the Marion Lang the Spring Hill um, and uh, Joanna Cavanaugh's Take Wing so all those are going on at Sassy Jack's and or um, a needle in the haystack and then if you want to do the Botany Bay 
Also, that was the uh, sampler of the month at the attic. So you can go to the attic if that's your favorite place. Either, either way, whatever works for you. So that's all the, the goings on. Now, Sunday is Susan Hookstra. She'll be back. This is the second time we've talked to her, but not talking about Susan Hookstra, talking about the National um, uh, Embroidery Teachers Association and all the work they're doing, all the teachers who teach all over the country and are not doing things online. Uh, I'm going to learn a lot about that and the tremendous resources that are available from that organization, in addition to some tips from judges about needlework. So that'll be Sunday. So um, that's it. That's the end of the list. Um, now let me get set up here so that we can talk with Krista about things. So, all right, so uh, Krista, tell, because we know you, we talk about you all the time for right. your cross stitch and embroidery. But we do not talk about right. much about <laughs> your uh, ecclesiastical work. So give us a little background for that sure. other half of your business. <clears throat> so in 1995, when I was 24 years old, I got the opportunity to do an apprenticeship with a traditional Greek Orthodox vestment maker. So I studied under her for three years. The first year and a half, I learned how to sew all the garments. I sewed anywhere from 30 to 60 hours a week because you have to learn how the garments are constructed so that you really have kind of a visual 3D image of everything in your mind. And then the last year and a half I spent with her, I learned how to do the pattern drafting and the fit work. And that's really critical because otherwise vestments don't fit. So now, and, and so kind of the short story is my website was the first ecclesiastical tailoring website on the internet I, through, like, I didn't make that happen. A friend of mine, like, was doing design and asked if he could borrow my stuff. And I was like, sure. <laughs> and so we were the first um, business of that kind on the internet back in 1998. And I thought it was just going to be a hobby. And it wasn't. It ended up being, like, a full job for me. And so um, I actually am one of like the only really like high end custom tailors for the Greek and Russian Orthodox churches in the United States. Um, I still do all the cut and fit work. The table you see behind me is, I mean, actually it's funny. I just finished like a 10 hour cutting day. And um, I have seamstresses that help me with the finish work. And so we produce, um, it really depends on the year. I mean, COVID clearly was weird. But we usually, in a normal year, produce about 100 sets of custom tailored vestments, and then cassocks, and we do altar claws and all that kind of stuff. And I just early on just became really, really interested in all the history of everything because it's such a long-standing garment tradition. It dates back all the way to um, early Christian Roman dress and even pre-Christian uh, um, Roman and Greek dress. And so I just became really, really fascinated. And it, the kind of the long and the short of it is I just kept educating myself and learning more and more. And I've been to Greece and I've done, um, I've been to Greece a, a bunch of times. And every time I just feel like I, I learn something more and I see something new. Um, but a big part of the Greek Orthodox vestment tradition are these really, really lavish brocades and embroidered fabrics. So a lot of our tradition, I like to always joke that in Greek Orthodox vestments, like we are kind of our, uh, you know, total policy is more is more. So, you know, <laughs> if it's, you know, burgundy velvet, gorgeous German velvet, like let's put a whole bunch of embroidery on it and then let's add a cross and let's add more stuff. Um, and so the tradition is still very lavish. In the Greek Orthodox Church and the Russian Orthodox Church, we never went through, say, a Vatican II simplification of our liturgical tradition. So all of our stuff is still very, very ornate. So in any given day, I'm usually working on um, real metal French brocades that have really large floral motif repeats. We'll look at those. Um, I might be working on um, poly brocades. Now, the modern ones are actually poly brocades, now polyester brocades that might have like rondell designs in them we'll see some a little later that are based off of like sixth century sassanid persian fashion influence into byzantium so like everything has a pretty long history with 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 the kind of fabrics that i work with um yeah and then in 2013 i got asked to well it's a little before that it was like 2010 i got asked to write a book about it 
So I wrote a book about it. Um, anyways, so yeah, so I just kind of like love everything having to do with this world. It's a very a colorful and very ornate world. And uh, I, while I've always loved embroidery, this is what I've done for 25 years, actually, as my, I like to call, I like to joke and call it my day job. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, this is, this is the work that I do. Yeah. Now, and I've now, outfitted, I have probably about, oh yeah, sorry. Krista, mm -hmm. uh, now you do in the U.S., do you do international work too? Or? Yeah, we do international too. So I don't have a lot of international clients, but I've, I've sewn for priests in South Africa, Denmark, Australia, New Zealand, Norway, Greece uh the uk yeah okay. we don't do a lot of international stuff just a little bit yeah but now it, there can't be too many of you in the world no there's very few of us um and i'm i'm let's just use the word picky you could also insert obsessive um about <laughs> supplies and like i still use the traditional 10 ounce canvas inside all the vestments and like i don't i don't take shortcuts because I want my vestments to look like real garments. My vestments actually look like real clothes. Um, and that's really important to me that they don't look like stage costumes. And that's actually really tricky in the modern garment industry because everything's designed for the throwaway fashion culture. Yeah. I mean, right now, every every client of mine who has ordered a, it's a particular piece called an epigonatian and it needs a specific type of double crown buckram and the U.S. supplier went out of business due to COVID, and we're waiting on a shipment from overseas to come in. And so literally every one of those orders that goes out the door, it's like, sorry, you're not going to get this. We have no idea if we're going to get it to you maybe in a month or two, we hope, yeah. because we've got to wait for that supply to arrive. Yeah. So supplies and sourcing are a really big part of my job, just so that I can continue making things to a certain standard of quality. Because these things are, are built not just to last a few years, but to last a long time. My minimum, my minimum um, garment life is 20 years. Yeah. And some of my other pieces, if they're real metal brocades, can go 30 to 50 years, no problem. Mm -hmm. They might need to have the linings cut out and re-put in, but they're actually designed for that. They're actually, the linings are sewn in in such a way that it's, it's, I mean, it's not super easy, but you can slit them out, pull them out, and pop in new linings. Yeah. So that the lining kind of is designed to take the abuse and the wear and tear. Um, and then, and then it preser helps preserve the brocade. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. What, one of my, uh, when I was doing wedding photography, photography, I did one Greek Orthodox wedding and it was a full metal <laughs> in Chicago. I mean, full metal, oh, the Chicago, whole thing. Yeah. I was never so intimidated in my life. The priest came up to me, told me exactly where I could go, where I could not go. Yes. When I could take pictures. I mean, it was, it, I just kind of just yep. stood there and shook. And uh, um, it, was, it was just a and absolute gorgeous. Right? Oh, it like took forever. Hour. Took yeah, forever. Yeah. But it was it was yeah. one of the most beautiful weddings I ever photographed. But oh man, I was just shaking the entire time. Had me scared to death. Yeah, when so. my oldest daughter, when my oldest daughter got married, that was pretty fun because there were four priests, including her dad, because my husband's a Greek Orthodox priest, and they were all investments that I had made. So it was it was pretty awesome. Oh, wow. So yeah, but yeah, we we don't tend to do things small. No. Yeah. No, yeah, this one was not small. This was frightening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's let's get started here because we got a bunch of them. Okay. So um, yep. take you off screen, and we're going to go to this first one yeah. here, which is the peacock. Yeah, first, yeah, I just apologize for the quality. Some, my, I've been taking photos for like 20 years. So a lot of these, some of these are older photos um, because I wanted to illustrate. This is actually a peacock design. You'll notice, especially around the cross on the back, if you scroll up there, there there's the two peacocks there. The peacock bird motifs are used. Um, they're a very, very early design motif in textiles across many cultures. But they, because they're associated, because of they fly and they go up into the air, they're associated with um, with heaven. They're associated. Peacocks are particularly associated with immortality. And because of like their big, you know, showy tails and plumage and things like that, they're because they're themselves are such a beautiful bird. It's a lot of why they're used in the liturgical uh, fabric canon sort of thing. But they're also used like in all sorts of um, historic art. You'll see them carved. Um, we even in Greek Orthodox churches, they'll even be carved into the icon screen at the front of the church. Sometimes you'll see peacocks 
oftentimes combined with flowers like you see here, floral sprigs, and sometimes with urns. Um, urns usually indicate like a fountain of life. They sort of are a shorthand uh, symbol for fountain of life. But birds are seen um, in Mediterranean folk embroidery. There's some very famous ones in the Benaki Museum in Athens. But yes, birds are a really big deal. It's kind of funny when, if you guys all remember when, when, the, um, when the TV show Portlandia came out and there was an episode, I think they put a bird on it. It just cracked me up because I was like, oh yeah, put a bird on it. Like we've got lots of bird stuff. And if you move on to the next photo, well, if you move first, on to the next first, photo, Krista, Krista, oh, yeah. uh, first, we're going to see several of these garments. So tell us what this garment is, how it's oh, used. I'm sorry. You bet. Okay. So what you're seeing here is a felonian. It is a Greek Orthodox priest felonian. It's worn by the priest during the liturgy and other sacraments. Um, this is a low back version, which you'll notice that it basically conforms to the shoulders. The next one I'm going to show you is a high back version. You can see what that is. Okay. This is a high back Oops. where it goes up. Okay. Whoop. There we go. There's a lot of there's a lot of speculation as to how the high back um, and the low back like kind of originated, but the best guess that I can make and what I published in my book is that the high back actually is it's before shoulder dart technology. So before we knew to put darts in garments to make them better fit the human body, we were used to having like larger excesses of fabric because we didn't know how to dart them and like remove that fabric. And also when you're living in a time in an age when all fabric is made by hand, you really try not to waste any fabric by like cutting it out. And so I think the high back is um, probably the more ancient and historical model. It's just, what has developed is that they've got that stiffening in the upper portion and that stiffening part that makes it kind of stand up so that it really creates, as you can see here, this amazing, okay, this one is a low back. So this one doesn't have the stiffening in the top. It just fits to the shoulders and the neck area. Okay. But the next one that we're showing that's the burgundy, same garment, just a little bit different variation. This one has two unique features. It's that it's got the, the high back. But one of the reasons, um, not all my clients do it, I would say maybe, I only probably only 10% of the vestments that I make are high back like this because they're a bit of a workout to wear. They're heavy, they're hot, and they're really like, you really have to be committed to the style. And the priest can kind of decide what they want to wear. And so, so but the real thing from my point of view as a design angle is that upper section. And in Greek, it's called an epanomitis. It's the upper section in the shoulders. So you can see how it can be lavishly embroidered. Now this is marine, this is, I'm sorry, machine embroidery. And it's actually done by a friend of mine in the Ukraine who does the most glorious machine embroidery. He does a lot of my crosses and things like that. And he developed this um, peacock design. This one's really gorgeous too, because you can see one peacock is done in red and one is in blue. And then the flowers on either side of them are the reverse color. And again, mm. they're shown with a lot of vine work and they're shown with a cross. So you have this idea of the cross and immortality going on here and, and, and heaven too. So that's all part of, of, of what's going on here. Okay, yeah, Krista, Krista so, take, us, take us through the process of having this piece made. Uh, do, you, okay. do you design it and then tell him what to do? Uh, do you send material to him or how, how, how does that process work? Okay, so okay, if I if I get a client who comes to me and say I want I want this set, the brocade, the lower portion of the garment, I have that I import that from Greece and I have that here in my shop. That's a lot of what you're seeing on the shelf behind me. Now, um, when you see me like in YouTube videos and things like that, is those brocades. Now, the trim, the galoon comes from either Athens or Thessaloniki, and I also keep a lot of that on hand. Galoon for me is like paint is to a painter, an artist. Galoon is like what I get to like play with. Now the embroidery, when that happens, that's something where a client has to say, okay, I want something really fancy or like this. And then I go and I check and see, okay, does Yvonne have it in the Ukraine? And what is his price point? And what can he offer? And then I go and check with my guy in Greece and like, well, what does Dimitri have? And um, I've actually gotten to work on two of these in my career that are actually fully hand embroidered gold work metal thread on silk and they're gorgeous and so wow. we get Whoa, wait wait a minute 
so, yeah. something like this completely hand embroidered with gold gold work yeah oh, and that i sourced word. from a family firm that i've worked with in india for over 20 years and they do museum reproduction work so anything that we want that's like literally museum level quality we source it there and then what happens is they ship the raw piece to me and so i'll get the piece of velvet or a piece of silk that has the embroidery on it and then i have to take my patterns and the client's measurements and then i have to custom tailor and cut out that whole piece of fabric and then match it to the brocade and then there's interfacing there's two layers of that canvas interfacing that goes underneath that so that it stands up and like you can see the design Mm. And then wow. I put all the lining pieces and the canvas and I put all the galloon together with it. And then it goes to my finished seamstress and she puts it all together. And then it finally goes out to the client. It takes about a set like this, just because it takes us a while to get these specialty materials made, can get anywhere from six to 12 weeks. Mm. And this is, this uh, is. So uh, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, sure. So the machine. The guy that does the machine embroidery, does he do that using a computer or does he like, does he hand feed it through the machine? No. Okay. So we use two kinds. Like, so yeah. for this kind of thing, Yvonne, I think he has a computer set up. Um, I'm almost positive that he does because he also makes um, crosses for me too. But he's like this mm -hmm. really, like he's just a very, very tiny business in the Ukraine. And he actually happened to find me like 10 years ago. And when I saw his quality, I was like, yes, please. <laughs> um, and so he does, I think, work with a computer to like create the designs and then like get that. Most of the embroidery machines that are used for this kind of a thing are basically like an AutoCAD program hooked up to mm -hmm. an, a machine, an embroidery machine. Right. Now in Greece, okay, if you go back to the photo back, okay, the other one, the first one that you showed. Yep. That kind of fabric is actually, I got to see that being made in Greece and that's really cool. What it is, is it's this huge table that's about 10 feet wide and it has a movable arm in it, uh, above it, to which nine embroidery machines are mounted on a movable bar. And that wow. is all done by AutoCAD and they feed in and it, it, this fabric comes to me and it's not cut out, but all the motifs are like where I need them. And then I just have to decide how big do I make the neck or how long do I make the felonian or this sort of a thing. But it's all like embroidered in place on the fabric, like specifically for Greek Orthodox vestments. And wow. so these are actually done and I got to see it done and it's really cool. Now, some of the designs, I think we've got one later on coming up. Did I give you the blue? Anyways, some of the designs like this too are actually done in a border style where there's a very large design that's embroidered around the entire border of that cape-like garment, that felonian that we're mm. looking at. And that I also got to see made in Athens. Did and we, that they did, definitely- Krista, Krista let, me, let me fire ahead because I think is it that sky, Did I give you the blue one? that sky blue one? Yeah, wait, this is, I know, I was trying to remember if we have that one here. Yep, okay, there's there. the blue one, yay, yeah. that one. Okay, this one, that's one of them. We call this a border style, but this one, actually, we have to submit, I have to give them a full sketch of my client's measurements, height, front length, everything, and then they embroider that in place. And there's somebody that has to sit at the sewing machine and just very gently move the fabric like every couple of minutes to get that curve. Whoa. Wow. That was super fun when I got to see that wow. done. I've actually got to see it a, a couple of times, both in Thessaloniki and Athens. But whenever, I, I'm just shameless. I'll just be like show up at their shops and be like, okay, I wanna see everything <laughs> behind the scenes, like now. And they're like, oh my gosh, it's a crazy American lady. And um, <laughs> But I love seeing how the stuff's made because I, I want to understand mm -hmm. how it's made. These are incredible sets. So these sets are just wow. absolute showstoppers. I mean, real showstoppers. They're just stunningly beautiful. They're very expensive, so, but, they're very, but they're expensive because somebody has to sit there and babysit that machine for hours and hours yeah. and hours while it makes, does all that stitching. Yeah. But way back in the day before machines and computers, they would do this stuff by hand. This was all done by hand. And there are still some places in Greece where they do it by hand. A few wow. monasteries, the monastery of Ormelia in Greece is probably one of the most famous for hand embroidered vestment work. Um, but now a lot of it, I have worked on um, a couple of hand embroidered sets in my time. 
um, one, a really stunning one with hand embroidered icons, which was amazing. And that we had done by the firm in India because they just specialize. That's all they do is museum level gold work embroidery. And that's wow. actually the next, the next, in the next photo that we were just going to look at the third photo in the grouping, that okay. really stunning embroidered piece the, right the, after. The, yep. That one. Here. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So this, this is a Greek Orthodox epitaphios. Um, I kind of converted to Greek Orthodoxy for the vestments. Um, really the long and the short of it was. I was like, man, because I grew up nothing. And when I first walked into a Greek church, I'm like, oh my gosh, like if these people do embroidery, I'm joining this church. This is awesome. So you can even call us like the church of embroidery. You know, it's kind of funny, but it's really cool. This piece is actually an em fully embroidered icon. It is used at the, um, let's see, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, the Good Friday. I was trying to think how you say it in English. We say we say Holy Friday, but Good Friday um, service. And it is always embroidered. So this, we have a couple of things in our tradition that are icons that, that are always embroidered. They are never painted. And so this is one of those. And this is actually considered symbolically to be the beer of Christ. Like the, and we actually take it on procession around the church and then everyone walks under it and touches it for a blessing. And this one has the four apostles in the corners and a really beautiful, a really, really beautiful um, scene with all the figures, all done in gold work embroidery and then heavily ornamented embroidery um, kind of coming out of like a pineapple design in the um, in the kind of center borders there. You can see how that kind of that pineapple design oh, okay. right there in this right, there. Yeah, okay. right in there. That's like a pineapple palmette kind of pomegranate design. Those three are all really interconnected. And that is another symbol of immortality. So and then the ideas of flowers, because for this service, we 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 decorate the tomb of Christ. It's the major part of the service. So like we actually echo that in our textile art. We bring in all this floral design to go with it. Because when you see a Greek, um, it's called a Kavuklian. And when you see that, it's like this, this um, it's like a very lavish decorated like little beer or tomb, usually heavily carved, very beautiful. And it's covered in flowers at our, um, on our Good Friday service. And are those jewels in there? Yes, weeks? they're not real, alas, but they oh. are like cubic zircona and little pearls and things like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. they do work oh, those beautiful. in. And then, of course, just the whole amount of um, fun toys that all the gold work people get to play with, like the bullion and the sequins and the, you know, all those things are there, too. Mm -hmm. So so and in a, in a typical church, this is a true treasure piece, then? Yes, Mo, um, every Greek Orthodox church has to own one. They have to have it for the Good Friday. And then it's very interesting. It is on after Good Friday. It stays on the um, altar, on the holy table for the 40 days of Paschal Tide. And then after that, it is traditionally always stored on the west wall. So Greek Orthodox churches are oriented facing east. Um, and this is on the west wall. So you, most churches that you go into, like you're walking under one of these as you leave church, every time you leave church through the most of the year. Oh. Yeah, they're pretty amazing. Wow. This is probably the most lavish one I've ever worked on. This was one where a client brought me a picture and was like, I want something like this. And they were actually able to reproduce it. But with the apostles in the corner and all of this, it's, it's really a stunning piece this is literally museum quality it's it's just incredible and i've only because these are expensive and because you know a church owns one and then they, they're going to own it for several hundred years i've only i've probably worked on maybe a dozen of these in in my 25 years you know, uh, they're certainly not an everyday thing embroidery and, and this is and another one okay this is another one where they they do the embroidery but they send it to us for finishing Okay. So like I, we have to put the backing on it and then we usually have to install some sort of casing or something so that it can be displayed on that West wall. Okay. So, mm -hmm. and that all has to be done very carefully so that we don't break any of the gold work. <laughs> the, the part, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this is obviously just a, an absolutely stunning piece, but the faces, you know, they, mm -hmm. they can look, they don't look cartoony at all. I mean, these are really no. some real. No, they're very, there. 
Yeah. They're very, um, they're very, yeah, the better quality stuff mimics the Byzantine silk split stitch stuff that was, there's a very, anybody who's really interested in these pieces, you can Google images, um, you can put like Greek uh, embroidered icon of Christ and then put in the word Despionetta, just like it sounds, Despionetta, D-E-S-P-I-O-N-E-T-A. Despionetta was the name of a very, famous embroideress and we think i mean scholars think that she actually owned like an embroidery workshop because so many works are credited to her there's no way that one human being could produce that many and the Benaki museum in athens has a number of her pieces um yeah so you can look and see more of those online and do you know what the words say around yeah, it's um, the so, noble Joseph took down thy pure body. Um, it's the it's a verse that's repeated in the service, and it's um, the noble Joseph took down thy most pure body and laid it in a tomb. So it's the inscription that's used on that. And right. interestingly enough, most of the ones that I've worked on in my time have actually had the inscription done in English because they're English-speaking Greek Orthodox churches. This one mm -hmm. happens to have it in Greek. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah, these are a treat. When these come wow. in the shop, it's like, it's kind of like party time at the West House. It's like, everybody <laughs> stops what they're doing. Everybody comes down and looks at it. We call the friends and neighbors like, hey, you want to come over and like see something really cool before we send it out to the client? Because it's just incredible to like, just to be able, I mean, it is just such an honor, honestly, to, to be in the presence of this kind of quality and workmanship is just, it's humbling, honestly, yeah. very, mm -hmm. very humbling. Oh, I can see yeah. that. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I just want to stand here, just sit here and just gape at this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing work. It really is. Wow. Okay, got to move on. All right, now this is... Uh... Flowers! Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we do lots <laughs> of flowers in Greek Orthodox uh, brocades, like tons and tons of flowers, flowers, urns, little ribbony things like vine work. Oh my gosh, so much of it. Um, and a lot of this is, is comes out of the classical tradition. And some of the brocades like this, this is, it very clearly has its origins in Venetian brocades that were very popular in like say the 15th, 16th centuries. Um, and we still use them. In fact, it's really quite interesting that on Mount Athos in Greece, which is the monastic center kind of of the entire Greek Orthodox world, it's ground zero of monasticism. And there's been monasteries there since I believe the seventh century or maybe earlier. They, it's very funny because there's many stories of like the asceticism of the monks. You know, they're so personally ascetical and they never eat meat and they, you know, they're, they live these very, very structured lives filled with prayer and services. But some of the finest vestments in the entire Greek Orthodox world will be found there. They wear some of the most lavish, the most ornate vestments of any place in the Greek Orthodox world is in Mount Athos. Because they have this understanding, they, we have this understanding that we always make the liturgy as beautiful as we possibly can. Um, and so this is just one of those fabrics. This fabric is a, tw it's a over 24 inch motif repeat, which means it's 24 inches from the start of one motif till the next. So this is like, like you're looking at basically almost well over a yard of that fabric. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very big motif. In fact, we have to order extra because the motif is so big. You know, if I get a client who's like three inches taller, or four inches taller, we may have to like use a whole nother half a yard, like just to be able to make the motif match, to do a lot of motif matching. But flowers are a really cool way that we incorporate the natural world and bring it into the liturgical setting, into the sacred space that we that we create in a Greek Orthodox liturgy. Um, there's a there's a really there's a Russian scholar and he actually calls the Byzantine liturgy a multimedia presentation. And I really love that that understanding because that's really what it's about that we're doing. We have incense, you know, and we have lights, you know, going on and going off. And we have the priests vested in these like amazing vestments. And we do things like we bring the natural world in through this stylized use of flowers. Now, there are certain times that flowers are 
really appropriate. Actually, the okay, the, there's two times that like flowers are super duper appropriate. And if you go to the next photo, I'll show you one. Okay, and I've got some questions a, too. Uh, so oh, we'll sorry. go ahead, keep going. This is, this is a, yeah, this is a brand new set. We just made this a few weeks ago. This is a classic Pasca Festal Brocade set. So this was actually made for a priest to wear at Greek Easter. And on this one, you can see, I mean, it's just a riot of color because we do not follow specific set liturgical colors the way that the Western churches do. So whereas the Western churches have like white for Easter or, or rose for um, a nativity or blue for something or green for that, our liturgical rubrics, the rules, like how things are done, actually only specify two color categories, bright and dark, not color names. Now there are local traditions that have grown, that have popped up and there's different traditions like all over, like some places like, okay, on the Isle of Patmos, they wear green for Palm Sunday. Um, whereas here in the US, a lot of priests might wear gold, but I, like I have a lot of clients who wear green for Palm Sunday here too. So there's a lot more flexibility and we really tend towards polychromatic brocades for festal use. And Easter for us is like the high point of our entire year. And, and this brocade is heavy too. This this bad boy is heavy. Like this is definitely a commitment um, because it probably weighs about eight to 10 pounds, that whole set um, with what the priest is gonna be wearing. Yeah. And on this one, I actually got to do something. I was really happy that the client let me kind of do what I wanted to do. And I wanted to create this contrast between the very heavy, lavish, really like over the top blingy brocade with this very kind of geometric, almost austere cross. But when you zoom in closer on the cross, you'll see it's another one of Yvonne's crosses. And he's done all this really cool stitch work in the middle of that geometric cross. Oh, so yeah. the closer you get to it, it's really elaborate. So okay. it just has this lovely, I was really happy with how this set came out. Um, aesthetically, like just kind of overall. Um, but you can see all those colors. So we have these flowers and these vines and this sort of thing. And so Greek Easter is one of the times that we have a lot of flowers on our vestments, very appropriate. And the other time is Feast of the Mother of God. Um, we sometimes refer to her as Panagia. It's sort of like the, it's kind of the Nana term for the Mother of God. Just like you call it, you know, you wouldn't say grandmother, or, you know, you call your grandmother, you know, your nan or your nana or whatever. We say Panagia for the mother of God. And her color tends to be associated with blue. And so we see a lot of blue fabrics with lots of flowers on them. You can see that in the next photo for Feast of the Mother of God. And those are really fun. This is one of my all time favorites. Um, just really gorgeous. This one actually has a slightly. Okay, Krista, 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 before you start on yeah. that. Before you start yeah, on that, you tell, tell, me. tell oh, yeah. us, I mean, this is this is not just your print off, run it off a printer fabric. Tell how this fabric is made. No. How do you buy it? Do you buy it by the bolt or do you specify a certain oh, amount? Got it. Okay, so these fabrics are woven um, custom in mills in Greece and in France. Um, and some of our stuff I think is made in Germany too. I purchase primarily through two wholesalers, one in Athens and one in Thessaloniki. The one in Athens ideal, he's the mill agent. And and for some of the stuff that we go through a lot of, not this kind of fabric, but the stuff that has a lot more, that's basically less expensive, we buy that usually by the bolt. And a bolt can be anywhere from 15 to 35 meters. And so, oh, no. and those, <laughs> those are really fun because we have to put in <laughs> months in advance when we need stuff. So for example, like last month, I had to, pro I had to provide my guy, the mill agent Athens with my list of what I wanted for the upcoming next six months because mm. they run one color and they finish that and then they run the next color and the next. And so if I missed, say, the purple run, uh -huh. it could be six months before I actually can get purple again. Mm. So that's another thing that makes things kind of challenging. So I try, it's kind of a fine balance. I try to keep a little bit on hand so that I can, you know, make something up if somebody needs something in a hurry um, and not like, but also like not over purchase. So, well, I, so then, I, would, I would, I would guess then, yeah, you got to really watch your inventory because you can tie up a lot of money absolutely. 
Yeah. Exactly. And then this kind of fabric, though, we always order like custom. So these kind of fabrics are so expensive. I can't really afford to keep these just around the shop. <laughs> and so, and, and they're so specialty. So these we order in like five meter cuts um, from a different supplier in Thessaloniki. Um, it actually, okay, so funny story. So my supplier in Thessaloniki, um, I use him for all of my really, really high end stuff because um, it's a it's a third generation business and the grandson is now running it. It was the grandfather and then and then the father and now the son is running it. And about I don't know, 12 years ago, the son was like in his 20s. He found me on the internet and was like, hi, like I'm in Greece. Do you want to buy fabric for me? And at first I thought, <laughs> what? Who is this crazy guy? And then on my next trip to Greece, I went into his shop and I was like, oh, oh, wow. Like they've got the good stuff. Mm. And so I'm standing there and I, and I'm, you all know me as nice and friendly Krista, who does the Avlia folk embroideries. If you ever meet me at a mill agent shop or a sourcing thing, <laughs> oh, you don't want to mess with me. She's a monster. I'm always, I'm, I'm, I cannot, I am really tough. And like, because, okay, most of my clients, you know, they're not doctors and lawyers and engineers. They're priests and, the, you know, they're having to plunk down over a thousand dollars for these custom made sets of vestments. And I want to always honor that and make sure that we get them the very best quality possible. So if some mill agent like tries to like put one over on me and show me a crappy fabric, I just call them out on it and say like, I don't want that. And um, <laughs> don't even show me that. I'll just tell them, don't even show me that. And I'll be really rude and like in their face because like, it's not worth my time. I'm not flying 6,000 miles to like go be shown schlock. So anyways, so <laughs> I'm in the shop and I'm doing my whole routine and I'm kind of like sitting there and I'm doing my whole fussy, you know, vestment diva routine like hmm, i don't know and then i start seeing where their really good stuff is and the dad is sitting in the back supposedly not speaking any english but i can tell he understands english he understands and so he looks at me and after about an hour he turns to his son and he goes holy scholastic he and i'm like huh i don't know that greek word it, it's very something i don't know what it means so I come back home and ask one of my Greek friends, and I'm like, what does scholastiki mean? And she goes, oh, like erotic, but better. <laughs> <laughs> so his dad, actually, I totally won his dad's respect because I was so like obsessive about getting the best quality. So I work with them a lot. And actually, they, they've now like become family friends. So like when we go to Greece, we have dinner and hang out. And they're, they're lovely, lovely people. Yeah. But his dad really <laughs> always has done like the high level, really nice brocades like this, like this one. Mm -hmm. Now, this uh, is uh, gorgeous. Uh, business tip for you, Krista. As soon as we're done here, go buy the URL vestmentdiva.com. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You want that one. I know. I really should, shouldn't I? I yeah. know, right? You want no, that one. I know. Oh, this is gorgeous work. And this is all yes, woven. This one's beautiful. Yeah. This is all woven with metal threads woven in. And then if you zoom in, notice how the little vases that the roses are in, see there? Yeah. They almost have like a little mm -hmm. Egyptian flair. Isn't yes. that the coolest? That's part of why I like this. This mm -hmm. has this really unique kind of Egyptian classical, little bit of Venetian influence. It's a yep. really lovely brocade. Yeah. Beautiful. Wow. And again, well, we have the flowers and the vine work and all that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, we wouldn't really have a discussion of Greek Orthodox textiles without having a discussion of cross motifs. But, and while <laughs> many of the fabrics I work on have cross motifs, not all of them do. But this is just a particularly fine example of a Justinianic cross. This is like sort of this, this design here, we can kind of unpack this a bit. This one has very beautiful, very sort of early Byzantine geometric crosses. They're equidistant arms to the cross. It means like all the arms are the same length. And then we have those lovely little leaves coming out from each cross, the little starburst in the middle. And then it's set in a rondelle. Now that circle, rondelle is really just a fancy art history term for circle. Now, <laughs> if you can zoom out a bit, zoom out so we can see the whole thing again. Here we go. Awesome. Now you'll notice something interesting. So those rondelles are um, set in what's called a half drop motif repeat. So what that means 
is there's a row of them. You can see the row at the top near the trim. And then the next row is set halfway down and halfway across. Mm. So you get that alternating row effect, okay? That's called a half drop motif repeat. That is an innovation that came about probably sometime around the seventh, eighth, ninth century. We don't know exactly when, because it used to be that all the rondelles were just stacked one on top of each other like a grid. Actually, very mm -hmm. much like the embroidery design that Jennifer is working on. So Jennifer, the oh, Byzantine okay. rondelle design that you showed, that set up in the very early Byzantine design of having circles on top of circles in a grid design. We know from um, art history research that though that idea of the rondelle was very popular in Sassanid Persia and made its way around the fifth, sixth century into Byzantium and became sort of a feature of early Byzantine art. And then it evolved into this half drop style. And now I would say 80% of the fabrics I work on are in the half drop style like this. This is one that I just particularly like because again, it has that lovely contrast of having those very, very geometric crosses but instead of those looking too simple or too plain, there's all that little bit of like fret work and vine work all around it that just that ground of like vine work and floral work that those crosses kind of like come out of visually. So this is a really, really beautiful brocade. Really, it's got this lovely sort of restrained, elegant quality to it. Yeah. This is also a metallic brocade. Heavy. A lot of weight. This one actually isn't quite as heavy, but no. yeah. Not quite as heavy. Okay. <laughs> you can actually stand up straight. Okay. <laughs> you can stand up. I know. I know. Uh, all right. Going to move on to this next one here. Oh, man. Look at this okay. thing. So this one's really neat. This one's oh, really unique, wow. too, because if you get in close to it, you'll see this one's unusual because it has flowers and wheat sheaves. And this mm -hmm. is... This is like one of the only fabric, well, no, I think I have one other one that has wheat sheaves, but this is unusual to have flowers combined with wheat sheaves. So the flowers are definitely like big motif, big symbol in, in Orthodox liturgical vesture, but the wheat sheaf also because of its symbology with Holy Communion, because we use um, leavened bread. We, we bake bread with, you know, that has yeast and we use that for our, for our communion bread. We don't use unleavened bread. And so this idea of the wheat with the bread, that's always like a symbol of Holy Communion for us. This is a stunning brocade. I love this brocade. It's very inter interesting because it has both gold and silver in it. And that's that can be hard to pull off in brocades. Um, it's just challenging to get those tones because the silver tends to be cool, the gold tends to be warm. And if it's not done well, it tends to look kind of cheap and costumey. But this one mm -hmm. looks amazing. This one comes in a couple so of different the, colors, but I love it in the red. And this has got a neat story. I had this guy, this one's from maybe about a year and a half ago. And I had a guy email me and say, you know what? My priest is just so wonderful. And I just don't know how to thank him. And so I want to just give him a set of vestments. And I want you to make the most over the top set, no holds bar. <laughs> goes, I don't want him to know because I don't want him to know it's me. I literally just want him to get it. So he totally donated this anonymously to his priest. It was amazing. Oh, wow. He was, yeah, he was just lovely to work with. Yeah, it was really neat. It was wow. a really fun project. And then this also has a machine embroidered cross on it, which you can see there that has a lot of um, pad stitching in that cross. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's Yeah. And then those are because, uh, again, on synthetic that... stones of some kind? Yeah, Swarovski crystals. Oh, okay. Those are Swarovski crystals inset into the cross. Mm -hmm. It's it's wow. amazing. It's amazing this. I see what you mean because this could become really gaudy in a hurry. But it, it exactly. isn't. It is, it is so rich and gorgeous. Elegant. But it's just yeah. that, mm -hmm. just this side of really gaudy. Yeah, it's beautiful. Exactly. Wow. And that's what I'm always looking for in a, in a metallic brocade like this is I don't want to cross over into that that gaudy range. I want it, and the way you do that is by buying just crazy expensive, really good brocade. <laughs> so that's really the only trick, you know? It's like you just Throw have to money work out the money for the really good brocades, exactly. And and you can tot this is something you can completely tell the quality from 20 feet away, 30 feet away. Oh, it yeah. just looks mm -hmm. different. 
Yeah. It's a tell, stunning you can, design. You can tell the quality just sticking your nose in it. It's gorgeous. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. And the quality on this one just gets better the closer you get to it because you probably can't see it in the photo, but those little silver flowers almost have like a little bit of a textured stitch in them. They're really beautiful, like a texture oh. there. They're really pretty. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that silver looks almost white. Maybe that's why it works. Exactly. I think it is. Well, and we do a lot with three color brocades. So a lot, if our brocades aren't multicolored, okay. um, we, we really don't use monochromatic brocades, hardly ever. And so most mm -hmm. of our brocades like, are kind of every Sunday, you know, kind of bread and butter sets are a lot of like gold with red or green with gold or blue with gold. But some of my very favorite brocades are three color brocades because the whole thing just like comes alive when you add that third color, that little mm -hmm. bit of accent. Like these, this fabric would not be nearly so effective without those silver flowers. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. We're on photo eight of 23. We got to get going. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay. But we can cruise through a bunch of this stuff. Yeah. So the next one here. Okay. So this is a, this is a um, fully dressed altar cloth, which means it's a bottom cloth with a top cloth put over it. This is machine embroidery. I did this for um, a church in uh, Chicago. And this is an example of how we use machine embroidery. This is grapevines. And we use grapevines and grape leaves, grapes and, and grapevines and grape leaves very commonly because it's associated with Holy Communion. So this one's pretty basic, but yeah. But these are really beautiful. And this kind of style of this fully dressed altar cloth is something that I specialize in. Um, I do quite a lot of these for churches around the United States uh, because I'm one of the last people still doing um, altar cloth orders because every order is custom. There's like yeah. nothing, every table is a slightly different size. Um, and then we put the tassels on the corners. Um, these are such fun to work on. I mean, they're just glorious. It makes the altar look like a little jewel box, you know, oh, when you, yeah. when you're, <laughs> You know, when you walk into an Orthodox church and this is what you see like 50 feet away, it's just a stunning effect. Yeah. So no, this no. is an example of how we use, this is very common in Orthodox churches to see machine embroidery with grapevines on a burgundy velvet background. Yeah. Very common. Jennifer, yeah. Jennifer, no, this is just, this is just basic, <laughs> Jennifer, just basic. Yeah. I, <laughs> I was like, basic, really? I was like, that's pretty fancy oh, basic. Oh man, that's gorgeous. <laughs> this is very, it well, is it's beautiful. very elaborate. But in terms of like, will you see this in a lot of churches? That's what I mean by basic. A lot yeah. of churches have these. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. Like standard. Okay, got to, got to keep yeah. moving now. Yeah. Whoops. Yeah, we'll keep That's moving. Beautiful. We'll keep moving. This is just another one with grapevines, oh. so we can just look at this one quickly. Oh. But this is a lightweight set for a priest. Really elaborate cross. I just particularly like this cross and how ornate it is because the cross oh, yeah. in it has like these really cool leaf and and you know leaf effects, which is really cool. Now, and the grapevines on this one. Are pretty Krista, you say lightweight. Would would a priest have say a summer set or or a a, a summer sets and a, and a winter absolutely. sets? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. <laughs> absolutely. Because especially if you are serving in Texas and your church doesn't have air conditioning, oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh dear. You're not wearing eight pounds of vestments. Mm -mm. No way. No how. Um, I have a lot of <laughs> clients in the south who have gone to this like lightweight embroidered style entirely. And it's what they wear all year long because it's just so hot, you yeah. know, where they are. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of really cool designs. The peacock design we saw the first, you know, at the very beginning of the show, that's one of these. Um, I do a lot of these because they're comfortable, but they're also really beautiful. And mm -hmm. if you look, look in the background, you can see the, the, the cloth. Look at all that. Yeah, you yeah. can yeah, you can see all my brocades in the back. Yeah. <laughs> and the next one and the next the next photo you'll see even more with the galoon and the brocades. Oh, there we go. So there oh, you yeah. go. So oh. there's all the galoons wow. stacked up in the back. That's one of six shelves that we have galoon on. Because okay. again, I just am never really sure what's gonna look the best. I mean, some things I like pick a galoon and I stick with it like all the time. But sometimes I'm like, wait, mm -hmm. I'm feeling a little different today and I want to use something different. So now, that so that galoon the galoon stuff, that that's kind of your your trim and toolbox. So you keep as much of that around as you can. So you have variety. I have to. Yeah. Okay. Because we can literally be held up on finishing an order if we don't have the galoon. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I have to keep a lot of galoon around. And then also like if someone comes to me is like, well, we want a full altar cloth. Like I just did an altar cloth set for a Greek church in um, New York. 
and that took 22 meters of brocade. So you can only imagine how much trim we went through. I think it was well over 100 yards of trim. And so we've got to make sure that we're ready for those orders. So we have to keep some of it around. Yeah. yeah. Now this piece here. Now this, okay, so this is actually showing one of the things that we use a lot in our kind of everyday kind of more standard brocades. And that is knot work. Knot work, um, it's interesting. This is a fully Greek fabric, but it looks almost like Irish or Celtic because of mm -hmm. all that knot work in there. And knot work is actually, um, it dates back to pre-Christian times and knot work was considered an apotropaic symbol, which means it warded off evil. So people would oh. put like knot work designs and things like that on their clothing. Um, and it would be one of these things that people felt like they felt like it warded off evil. Mm -hmm. um, people would also sew little mirrors in their clothes because that way if the demon looked at you, the mirror would like only show him his own reflection. So we have wasn't this the idea. Knot work, wasn't the knot work supposed to like trap the bad spirits into a pattern that they couldn't get out of and get at you or something? Oh, I haven't why heard that, I... but that makes perfect sense. Why? That makes sense. Why does that? that, that, that would I don't know where sense. I might have heard that, but. That would make actually perfect sense. And it's very interesting to yeah. me that a lot of Byzantine knot work, which you see not just in the liturgical textiles, but you see it in illuminated manuscripts and in iconography borders and things like that, mm -hmm. has this real um, affinity with Celtic knot work. And, you know, and interestingly enough, I saw it, we just, we're starting to understand, scholars are starting to understand how much more mobile the ancient world was, much more mobile than we think. Mm -hmm. And so I think there was a lot more interchange of ideas. Like I was stunned. I just I just got this whole collection of vintage Latvia needlework booklets and I've been using them for some upcoming Avlia designs and I was stunned to open them and look at what were designs that I knew as Greek and Byzantine designs. And I was like, wait, it's Latvia. Yeah. It's like, I mean, we're up like near the North Pole. Like what's going on? But there's <laughs> all this design interchange from all of these people groups moving around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gorgeous. So right. knot work wow. is very big. A lot of knot work. In fact, I actually just had Yvonne design me the most gorgeous set of Celtic crosses. We're just starting to use them and they're just beautiful. Yeah. So we did Ooh. those. That was real fun. We kind of worked on that project together. Yeah. All right. This is another one, more knot work. This one, I love this one. It, it, it's almost like Art Deco meets Byzantium. Um, <laughs> I love this design. Yeah. Uh, this is one of my all-time favorites. When you look at that knot work in there between the crosses, it's just lovely. And it's got a very kind of Art Deco feel to it. Um, and this is just like kind of one of our standard kind of, you know, bread and butter every Sunday kind of sets. But I love this design. I never get tired of working on it. I work on it in multiple colors. I probably have it in like seven colors in the shop. And I just love it. Wow. Really live, really vibrant. Yeah, it's beautiful. A lot of energy with that knot work. That's the thing too. You get a lot of visual energy and movement with that knot work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And this is another one with yeah. knot work. <clears throat> this one has a lot of knot work too. This one's a little bit bigger and more lavish knot work. And this one's just really cool. This was a Russian Orthodox deacon set that I did. And we combined it. You'll see this kind of combinations in, in like a fancier set of vestments where we use a really elaborate brocade and then we, use, we pair it with a machine embroidered accessory. So like, for example, this Orarian, which is a deacon stole, is machine embroidered, but it harmonizes with this brocade. I love doing sets like this that are very layered. You know, a lot of lot of special effects there. This okay, is a so, beautiful. So, Krista, place. say what we've not seen this stole in anything so far. So what is that called again? Okay, so this is called an orarian. Okay. And this is the deacon's stole. So just like a priest has a stole, our deacons have stoles. Okay. But theirs is a little bit different style. Oh yeah, I guess I didn't give you any front photos. I was giving you all the back photos. Well, if you want to see what the stole looks like, just go over to the website and you can see like a gazillion stoles. But but um, even even at the end, it uh, you actually pick up the game at the end with the fringe and. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah, the double yes, and on a priest stole, actually, there's a really interesting symbology about that. The priest stole is also finished. The priest stole is like the deacon's orarium, except for 
it is actually fastened in the middle. It kind of goes, it's worn around the neck and fastened in the middle, like down the front of the priest with buttons. And the bottom of it is also finished with those double rows of galoon and fringe. And the fringe mm -hmm. is there to symbolize all the people that we say are, we, we use the phrase there, under the priest's stole, which means that if he hears, it's all the people that the priest hears confession from. So it's mm -hmm. the idea of all the souls under his yeah. care. The little, all the little fringes symbolize all the people under the priest's care. Oh. Oh. Which is another little bit of symbology there. Yeah. yeah. Now, am I right in that uh, with the Russian, there's a, a, a very different style? Yeah, it's not very different. Um, what, what the biggest primary difference is here is you notice how there's that galoon that goes kind of, that goes horizontally right under the cross. Yeah. That mm -hmm. actually continues along the front of the, of the garment. And that we call that a galoon bib. So it creates like this square across the front and the back. And then the stole, um, is a little shorter than in the Greek tradition. So there's a few minor stylistic differences. They're really, most people, I mean, if you didn't know the tradition, a lot of people wouldn't even notice them. Oh, okay. And if you go to the next slide, I gave you a close up of this fabric so that you can see what I'm talking about with the knot work. There we go. There's the fabric Ooh. and you can see that amazing knot work. Even the cross is a knot work. Everything's a knot work on this design. Mm -hmm. It's just stunning. And this is also a big motif repeat. I think this one's about 12 to 15 inches. It's big. <laughs> wow. So impressive. So that's not work. I like I like the tendrils that wrap. I do too. It gives it this like Those energy are... and, and like liveliness, mm -hmm. doesn't it? And like it feels mm -hmm. almost like a garden, but yet here it is like all done in gold. I love this one. Yeah. All right. The Cairo one. Yep. Okay, so oh, onograms. Wow. And this one also shows the rondelles. So this shows that early Byzantine setup where I was talking about the rondelles in a grid. This is that. Mm -hmm. um, monograms are huge in Byzantine art. Um, monograms for everything. And we have monograms on our icons and then letters are always like turned into their own decorative element. It's really cool. This is the key row and alpha and omega. And so it's the um, Christ and then the Alpha and Omega. This is one of the most common of the of the Greek, uh, of the Byzantine motifs, uh, monograms. But yeah, the Byzantines love monograms. And we have like a special monogram for the Mother of God that's usually on her icons as well too. Mm -hmm. So everybody gets a monogram. So <laughs> lots of monograms. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. Okay. All right, this one is, oh, this one stopped me here. Yeah, this is a, yeah, this is an older photo, so I apologize for the quality. But what this is, is this is a reproduction of a, of a historic style of, of um, Deacon Stole. This one's shown in the Greek style. And it has holy, holy, holy on it. Because our deacons, we understand them to symbolically stand around the altar the way that the cherubim and the seraphim stand around the throne of God. So mm. we have this... This particular garment is just absolutely chock-a-block full with symbology because we have our cross, we have our fringe, we have the holy, holy, holy. And then you see the angels, the, the angel depictions there. And then in addition, you'll see that, that that middle section that loops around the hip is all grapevines and grape leaves because that represents that the deacon assists at communion. So this is very symbolically rich. And mm. I've done this design. I actually had this design made for me by an Orthodox iconographer who did the sketches for me based on like my providing with like historical, you know, the historical layout and everything. And then I've done, I've had this done both as a um, machine embroidered piece and also as a hand embroidered piece. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. All right. Okay. I'm gonna keep moving. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, yep. We're almost there. We've got just a couple more. So the next one is the Gamadian design. This is basically, this just shows kind of geometrics, but this design, those, okay, so you have the cross in the center, but then you have those little things that look like a square around it. Those are actually called a Gamadian, and it comes from the Greek letter gamma, the G in Greek, and which is like that kind of a symbol. And this was a really common decorative element used in um, the ancient, like in the ancient world, you'll see it sometimes in tile work or things like that. 
So for say, say if I have a client who's just like, oh my gosh, I just cannot stand wearing those flowers. Like we'll do something <laughs> a little bit more sort of, uh, shall we say manly, you know, we'll do something like this. It's a little more geometric, you know, a little simpler, that kind of a thing. And, and, and we kind of, this is like kind of both ends of our, we have this wide spectrum, everything like the big heavy floral stuff to this in, in our tradition. And you can see pretty much all of it in almost like any liturgy. So it's, it's really up to the priest because our priests buy their own vestments. Okay. Not so, the, the so this is like for the, because for they the, have to the person. So this is like for That's the for jock priest, pre not jock priest then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I okay. love that. Yep. 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 <laughs> Wow. Okay, my phone just told me I'm I'm losing battery power here, so oh, I just okay. want to make sure. For some reason, right. it lose me. Well, we, we saw the blue okay. one. Okay, we did the blue. Okay, we saw the blue. Ooh. The next one is a pineapple, and so I just thought I'd show this: pineapples, pomegranates, palmettes. These are really big motifs seen in the ancient classical world, and that were brought into and adapted in the Byzantine world, um, and even like all the way through. Um, you know, even into Renaissance Italy, Vene Venetian um, Italy, the, all of that yeah. have used these designs. They're very pleasing to the human eye. Um, and they represent, the pomegranate represents um, uh, immortality and hospitality. So there's this idea of plenty and um, connection to the divine and this sort of a thing that goes on. I really like pineapple designs. Yeah, I just good. did. I actually just did an embroidery hoop kit that was a pomegranate design because I loved. I love. I love <laughs> these designs. Yeah. Okay. These are probably this... my. Those kind of designs are probably my personal favorite. This is the next photo is another pomegranate design. It's a. Oh, it's a wow. design I did for a church in um, Southgate, Michigan. This is the Greek church in Southgate, Michigan, and we did that full oh. matching set of the pomegranates embroidered on dark blue velvet. It was stunning. I yeah, loved but, this. Wow. Set. Yeah, look at really look at the chair. Look at the. Ornate. I know those Holy chairs smokes. and on that rug. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And then you'll see the double headed eagles on the rug. We didn't really get into that, mm -hmm. but that's another bird symbol for Byzantium. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Yep. Wow. That's a really gorgeous. That's a really pretty machine embroidery design. See folks, this is why I was intimidated when I did that wedding. It was, it was, oh, a, wow. it, exactly. was a, it was a yep. Chicago church like this and yep. you just walk in, you can't, you can't even visually oh. take it all in. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, and it's goodness. actually intentionally like that's the intention is to overwhelm the senses. Well, it, it that's works. actually yeah. that's the whole point for us. Yeah. Man. Amazing. Okay. okay. You got, you, we Three don't want more. your phone to die. So we don't want my phone to die. I know. <laughs> so this is another rondelle design, early Byzantine, and this shows that grid design that I was talking about earlier. This has again mm -hmm. a very Justinianic cross with a really, really nice secondary motif repeat. So that the, they so they started putting the rondelles together as a grid and they were like, hey, we've got negative space. All right, we've got some negative space. Let's like put in some more things there. So then we get a secondary <laughs> motif, which is like another form of a cross. This is kind of like a floret cross in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this is another really beautiful design. It's got a very bold quality but with all that little intricacy. Oh, and then there, oh, you can see it in this one. Oh, I'm so glad I didn't think I put one in. Okay, so if you zoom in just a little bit, you'll see around the rondelles, it looks like dots. See all those little dots mm -hmm. around each rondelle, around yeah. the outer border, there's like that border of little dots. That's another apotropaic symbol. That's another symbol, like when people would sew mirrors to their clothing that wards off evil. Mm. Oh. So we can actually see that and most, I'm like, mo I mean, 95% of my clients would have no idea that's what those are actually referencing. But when I started doing research for the book and started understanding how apotropaic symbols work, I was like, oh my gosh, I like started seeing them everywhere in fact in the fabrics that I work with. And that's another example oh. of that, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. so much to these, so much. I know. Yeah. Wow. Okay. We got. Couple the more. Next, okay. Yeah, this the blue one here. Well, the blue one here is just another, it's another one in the rondelles. I was just showing that same idea. Here, though, notice how they scooted the rondelles apart to add a third motif. Mm -hmm. So there's actually mm -hmm. technically four motifs in this one. There's the main cross in the rondelle, there's the secondary cross that's in the crisscross between the two rondelles, and then there's those two little emblems. Actually, it's funny, I just worked on this fabric today. And there's these two little emblems. One is floral around these little berries, and the other one's a star. Yep. And that kind of like little, um, that's a, like a little hexagon shield thing in between them. 
So this one's really cool. This one's very, very ancient. That like the origins of this design are very ancient. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, but then we have to look at the last one. It's a really bad old photo, so I apologize. But this is a killer brocade. This is the, it's a brocade called Byzantium. It's made by Watts and Co in New York, er, sorry, not New York, in um, London. They're a very famous Episcopalian uh, liturgical goods supplier. Uh, their name is like synonymous with quality and it has griffins. It has like those griffin, like the griffin, mm -hmm. are they gri yeah, the griffins right there. And then it alternates rondelles of griffins with rondelles of this beautiful, like kind of thistle and flower effect. This is classic Byzantine rondelle because you see here, even the little interstices between the rondelles, they aren't that lavish yet. Um, I've gotten to work on this one twice in my career because it's a silk brocade. So it is very expensive. Whoa. It's mm -hmm. also a very unique shade of blue. Yeah, this set of vestments is like well over $2,000 at the current exchange rate. So very expensive. Wow. And that's a fully hand embroidered metalwork cross that's on there too. So that's a full like oh, wow. museum reproduction cross. That These are very fun sets. This one, it, the, the shade of the blue is also kind of unique too. I love this fabric. It's just lovely. Yeah. Gorgeous. So there we have it. Wow. Like a whole evening tour of like all the all the fun fabric things that I get to work with. Outstanding. Oh my. Outstanding. All right. Putting us back on the screen here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wow, thanks. All right, we got we gotta get you out before the yeah, phone dies. Those but, were beautiful. Uh, thanks so much. That was a treat. Wow. Oh good, good. <laughs> Little feast for the eyes. It's really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Look at all that stuff behind her. Oh my word. Yeah, and this is actually I just, know. I have like one, two, three, four. I have more shelving. <laughs> Lots more. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, Krista, thank you so much. That was a real treat. Really thank appreciate you. it. Appreciate the time. Thanks for having me, you guys. Thank you so much. A lot of fun. Avlia.life. Yeah, so beautiful. Avlia.life. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Okay, Bye. thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.